All right, with that, we'll officially start our program. Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Early Onset Parkinson's Disease, What You Need to Know. My name is Erin McGee. I'm the Community Program Manager of the Minnesota's and Dakota's chapter. Thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm so excited to have three wonderful doctors from the Mayo Clinic with us today. Um, we'd also like to know who's watching with us today. Please take a moment to answer the poll question, what is your connection to Parkinson's? We'll just take a moment to see the results come up. So it looks like we've got people with Parkinson's in the lead followed by healthcare professionals. So wonderful. So glad you're able to join us. All right. Again, if you have any problems, please let us know by hitting that chat button and we can help you. Thank you today to our sponsors, Accorda, Amneal, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Kern, and Lundbeck. And thank you today to the silver sponsor, Synovian. To learn more about these companies and the resources they offer, the Parkinson's community, including detailed product information, please visit our virtual exhibit hall located at parkinson.org slash Minnesota Dakotas slash chapter supports. When you visit this page, all you need to do is click on the sponsor's logo to find out more information. Before we get started, I would like to share a bit about information about the foundation. The mission of the Parkinson's Foundation is to make lives better for people living with Parkinson's disease by improving care and advancing research today until there's a tomorrow without the disease. In everything we do, we build on the energy, experience, and passion of the global Parkinson's community. We provide free resources, including our website, parkinson.org, educational book series, webinars, podcasts, our hospital safety kit called Aware and Care, and our toll-free helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO, which is staffed by Parkinson specialists. We are also having weekly webinars that you can find at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. We also invest more than $10 million annually to support the most talented minds in research to explore what causes Parkinson's, how to treat it, and ultimately how to cure it. We have launched a very exciting initiative called PD Generation, which provides free genetic testing and counseling to those with a Parkinson's diagnosis. After a successful pilot program, we are thrilled to announce that the PD Generation study has launched its next step, a genetic test that be, can be completed at home. Now more than ever, we know that having an at-home option is vital to reaching people with Parkinson's. Participants of this study can now submit their tests using the at-home kit and review the results with the genetic counselor virtually. To learn more and to get further information, please visit parkinson.org slash pdgeneration. All right, as we get started with the program, a reminder to submit questions by clicking the chat icon and typing your question. We will do our best to get to all the questions that are submitted after our three presentations. Now it is my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Rodolfo Savica, consultant and associate professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Savica. Feel free to get started by sharing your slides. I can see the slides just need to unmute. Here we are. Now, do you see me, guys? Yes. Thank and you. let me put this back where it was to be because, you know, I was having some issue before. Here we are. Good. So, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Savica, I'm one of the consultants at Mayo Clinic. I have a particular interest in early onset Parkinson's disease. We currently launched here, indeed, our early onset Parkinson's disease multidisciplinary clinic, which is an integrative clinic looking at different aspects of early onset Parkinson's disease because we recognize how different it is early onset Parkinson compared to late onset Parkinson. Today, my talk in the next 20 minutes, I will go quickly, but I will try to cover most possible ground 
regarding early onset Parkinson, the difference with early onset Parkinson, and what to do from a clinical management. Let me just click my slides. Here we are. I have nothing to disclose. Those are the learning, learning objectives uh, to review the current diagnostic features, review the treatment, and support the current theories on par Parkinson's disease and early onset Parkinson. Dr. Savika, I'm yes. so sorry to interrupt. I'm still having my coworker share her slides. Can you try to reshare yours again on our screen? Sure, absolutely. Uh, let me do it again. Yeah. I don't know what happened then. Let me do this. Um, stop participant sharing. Let me let me do it again, okay? Sorry, guys. Let me see what I can do, okay? Share screen, and it should be this one. Now, do you see me? Do you see them? Yes, we see them in presenter mode. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, let me go back very quickly. Those are the learning objectives I was saying, but let's start with that. You know, those are the cardinal, uh, the cardinal motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and you may be all familiar with that, which is present of rest tremor, bradykinesia, stiffness, tendency to fall in postural reflexes, and the onset in one side. Why I'm showing these slides? These slides shows a very old picture drawing done by one of the father of neurology, presenting the typical patient that was seen about two centuries, uh, at the late 18th, 19th century with Parkinson's disease, an older gentle lady, quite hunched, quite down. This is not what we see today. This is not what we're dealing today. This is what we're dealing today. If you look at the drawing down, you can see how the typical symptoms of Parkinson's disease are the same, but usually they are not seen in the typical way with rest tremor, with stiffness. You can see this, this lady here. This figure showed a gentle lady that is indeed running, is jogging, and she's having a foot that is inverted in, is inward. What is a dystonia? What is basically is a dystonia, it's a contraction of the muscle. In fact, many times, patients with early onset Parkinson's disease do not show up with tremor right away. They do, not, they do not show up with symptoms that we see in later onset Parkinson's disease, but mostly are active person that all of a sudden are having odd feelings in their body. Like for example, inverted foot, after a marathon, after running, they feel contracted, they feel stiff. And usually the first referral is to the orthopedics. Say, okay, well, you have an orthopedic condition. Well, no, indeed is a, a way, is a, a, a Parkinson syndrome that is behaving not exactly the, the same way the late onset Parkinson's disease is behaving. And that is the one important thing. Why we def how we define early onset Parkinson's disease? What is the age cutoff to make this definition? Sometimes you, you hear and you, you read young onset Parkinson's disease. Sometimes we are juvenile, sometimes we are early. But when is the cutoff? Well, the answer is that we don't know. The answer is that it's variable. The answer is that only today, only now, the International Movement Society, the most important scientific society on Parkinson's disease, is, the, is finally putting together a task force to define the age cutoff. Because in the literature, it goes from 55 years old, 50 years old, 40 years old, and it's not clear when this is happening. But it's incredibly important to know that. Why? Because the biology of Parkinson's disease, the frequency of Parkinson's disease, late onset, does not apply to the young onset. Things are completely different here. If you look at the incidence cases, so those are the number of new cases per population in a year, you can see the Parkinson's disease, here spelled PD, account for 14.2 cases every 100,000 people. This is the late onset Parkinson's disease. What about the young onset Parkinson's disease? Well, let me go here. We did a study. We noticed that the early onset Parkinson's disease when is defined as below the age of 50, it accounts less than one case per 100,000 person every year in our population. 
but also accounts for two. So in five years, between 50 to 55 years, the case double, which is an important thing to consider because this is something that helps us, will help define the definition of the onset and definition of the clinical findings. One important thing is that men and women are different. Well, we know that. Biologically, we know that. But also from a Parkinson's standpoint, men are having, a, men are affected much more than women, almost doubling. But you all know also that uh, we don't have a lot of information about these factors in early onset Parkinson's disease. We know that that trauma, we know that pesticides are absolutely associated with early, late onset Parkinson's disease, not early onset. We do not have this information yet. We have a lot of unknown there. And we also know that there's a number of non-motor non symptoms occurring early, such as lack of sense of smell. Now it's very famous for coronavirus, but in Parkinson occurs for a long time. Uh, tendency to live out our dreams, the re rem, REM behavioral disorder, constipation, anxiety, visual symptoms that are very common in late onset Parkinson disease. Well, they are not in early onset Parkinson disease. So, whenever we're dealing with somebody below the age of 55, some of the symptoms that are incredibly common later on may not be present. This makes diagnosis more difficult. This makes also making us thinking, which is true, that the underlying biology is not the same. The underlying biology is not the same, but when we see a patient with Parkinson's disease, we are suspicious. We have to first define Parkinsonism and yes, we have to understand if it's Parkinson's disease or not. Those are the symptoms we saw. I saw you before. Saw you before. You know the resting tremor, stiffness, slowness of movements, and probably with gait, tendency to fall, and so forth. We need to have two out of these four to make the diagnosis. But most of them are not specific. Cramps, look depressed, fatigue, weakness. Those are non-specific symptoms that can be the first and sometimes the only symptoms that can be present in early onset Parkinson's disease. Something that we can see when we take in the history as is written below. But I want to point out how cramps are incredibly common in early onset Parkinson's disease, way more than late onset sometimes. Or how weakness, fatigue, feeling tired, and you know, we're talking about people that are, as you know, 30, 40, 50. You may be tired for many other things because your kids are growing uh, and are giving you hard time, or maybe because you're not sleeping at night because you have some stressors. But those are things that can be seen. That's why the presentation of this condition is not, the, is not that easy to identify. Forget about the exam is something that we do, but you know, the symptoms are the same. We look at stiffness, we look at, at movements, we look at the amplitude of the movements, we look at the balance. This is very important to me. This is maybe one of the most important slides. If the age is below or 55 years old, we need to do additional testing because you know that if somebody is older, you know, we just do that, the test, we make a diagnosis based on clinical symptoms. But in younger individuals, we are forced, we need to look in something somewhere else. All my patients that are below 55, I have an MRI on them. Or at least one to make sure there's no structural problems. All of them, I look at seroplasmin, which is a protein that carries copper. And if I see some odd, odd numbers, then I have to look more into the copper biochemical pathway. All of my patients that are below 55, I look at this particular cascade of called lysosomal cascade. Those are proteins that can be elevated quite dramatically. It can indicate that people do not have Parkinson's disease. I have something very similar. They look like Parkinson's diseases that affect the kids, such as Gaucher disease, Pompeii disease, but can occur also in adults. We had to look at heavy metals, for sure. We had to look at split, the spleen and liver ultrasound. There are diseases that affect the kids that can occur in adults only. When there's some abnormality in the spleen and liver that we need to explore. 
what disease is called Chidiaki Gashi, very rare, but still something that can occur early on. And then we had to discuss genetic testing. I would not touch genetic testing because it would be touched by Dr. O Ross after me. So today I would not talk at all about genes just because Dr. Ross would be right after me. But it's important to consider the genetic testing, knowing the limitation of the test, knowing that we are looking only at risk genes, not protective genes, which is an important thing to consider. Typically, this is what we uh, give to our patients that are late onset, levodopa trial. We do, we start a medication, we start carbidopa levodopa, and we see if there's an improvement. It's not always possible in early onset Parkinson's disease. It's not something that we like to do easily, but I like to do a trial when I have a gentleman or gentle lady that has an event, for example, a wedding, upcoming wedding. I want to see if they're responding because maybe I may use the levodopa just for that particular few days before and after the wedding, not necessarily the entire time. One thing that we ask in everyone is this particular technique called that scan. That scan is a technique that attached to the presynaptic dopamine transporter. So the activity that occurs before when dopamine is moved from one terminal to the other terminal. And what we see in this case, we see something like that. On the left, you see these two comma shaped structures. They represent the basal ganglia. They represent the principal place of the brain where there's a deposit, there is a damage. If it's normal, you will see two little commas. If it's abnormal, you may see a dot and a comma. This individual likely is having Parkinson on the other side, the symptoms on the other side of the brain. In this case, he's right because it's a negative image. So this individual would have left side of Parkinsonism. You can see the clear asymmetry that is there. We always we usually order this in almost every patient that has early onset Parkinson's disease. And I think it's worth doing that. As you can see here, it's not helpful otherwise, but it's helpful always in early onset Parkinson's disease and helpful when a clinician is confused, I would say at times. This is an important theory that I had to touch base. This is the famous theory called Bragg theory, when we say that, that the generation occurs somewhere else and then ascendingly from the guts going to the brain causing Parkinson's disease. Well, this is not valid in early onset Parkinson's disease. It's not clear whether this famous theory that changed completely the phase of late onset Parkinson's disease can apply to early onset Parkinson's disease. We are dealing with something different. We are dealing with something, I don't, I don't know why it is there. I don't know why it is, I'm sorry. Where there's something different. If it's not Parkinson's disease, what it is, there's many other options. In a, a, a early onset, we need to look at tumors. We need to look at secondary Parkinson's, especially exposure to drugs that can cause problems. Strokes, however rare, can cause the problem. But ultimately, we made the diagnosis. We have somebody that comes to see us. We say, okay, likely this is Parkinson's disease. Likely it's early onset. We made all the different diagnoses. We are sure this is Parkinson's disease for the best that we can. What we do now? Well, we have to try to do a, a management of the, of the symptoms. As you know, there are some treatments that are neuroprotective, or at least trying to be, trying to reduce the delay of progression of disease, but we have to work on that. So we're gonna work on the neuroprotective treatment saying that so far, nothing has been proven to be effective. And there is no reliable biomarker that allows us to know who is progressing, but there's nothing that seems to be slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease. No matter what people say, in a sense that some advertisement are really up there, no, it's not the case. For example, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> here we are. The medication that some of you may know is called rasagilin, Azilect. Initially, it was thought to be a medication that can delay the progression of disease. In reality, this is a post from Fox is not showing there's, there is an effect on the line of progression. It's a symptomatic effect. So it's having still a role in improving the symptoms, but not protecting 
that uh, mm. not protecting against progression for the disease. And it's very important in early onset Parkinson's disease because soon we're going to enter in the controversy of treating or not treating, delaying the treatment or not delaying the treatment. So rasalgenine is only symptomatic. Likewise, there are others like coenzyme Q10 that you may have heard. It doesn't seem to slow the progression. It doesn't seem to improve so much symptoms, but it is not detrimental. So if somebody wants to take it, I have nothing against that. The hunt is still on. There are so many things, stem cells has been considered, neurotrophic factor, gene therapy, vaccine, to try to delay the progression disease, but yet we are not in that phase. We are not having anything yet able to do that. Other than this, all my patients with early onset Parkinson's disease, especially, they're exercising. Exercise has been shown to potentially <clears throat> delay the progression of disease and also reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease. So all of our patients are exercising. Very, very important. But the treatment is symptomatic. So we have to deal with its symptoms. And this is the problem that we have. Those are all the medication, more or less, that are available now. You may have seen them. Still, it's incredibly frustrating. This is the way it works. You can see that there's a different level of the receptors when the thing's happening. The best medication, and it's incredibly frustrating that after 50 years of using this medication, because carbidopoly was used the first time in the US in 1969, this is still the gold standard, the best medication to be using. Second, there are the others. But still, levodopa is like having the insulin in diabetes. There's a moment that we need to use insulin to treat glucose. So that's the entire point. The others are still helpful, especially the amine agonists are still helpful, but are helpful. They are not as good, as potent as a carbidopa levodopa. One of the most concernful aspects of using carbidopoly vodopa in younger onset people is the onset of dyskinesia. Dyskinesia is the weekly movements that occur after years of treating with carbidopoly vodopa. However, in some forms that are genetic forms of Parkinson's disease affecting the younger, these weekly movements occur a little bit earlier than a few years. In our current unpublished studies, we show that only 45% of patients are having dyskinesia and are having early onset Parkinson's disease. This is all severity of dyskinesia. Sometimes can be a little movement, sometimes can be very severe. And it's important to consider that it's occurring about every, after five years in early onset Parkinson's disease from the beginning of carbidopa levodopa. So if after five years, this condition is not there, is unlikely that it will occur. This means that about there are there are six, there are fifty five percent where this is not occurring whatsoever. It's still a good number, I would say. So the bottom line is that it's not happening to everyone. In some people, happen. In some people, it doesn't happen. And it has to do with the genetic background of this individual. Dopamine agonists are very helpful and many times are used as a first treatment in Parkinson's disease, especially in the early onset, because the entire idea is to delay the, the use of carbidopa levodopa to avoid this kinesia. I'm worried about that. I'm using them, but I always tell my patient that those are the most common side effects that you can see with dopamine agonists. They are, they are not necessarily dose dependent, so they can occur at any dose, and they're quite severe. I tell you, one of the most severe is edema, swelling of the feet. Happens a lot. Another very common one is these pathological behaviors. You know, we are talking about gambling, hypersexuality, but sometimes it's just obsessive behavior toward one hobby, one activity. I had a patient that whenever he sees a pawn, he needs to fish. And it's a problem. It can be incredibly intrusive for your personality if you need to fish every time you see a pawn. So it's very important to consider that. When we start this medication in early onset Parkinson's disease, we really have to be aware that this can be a problem. And if it's the case, the medication I recommend to be stopped, discontinued, because this is, can be something that can occur with other medication. Here is a quite crowded slide showing how much 
develop is superior about anything compared to anything else in a few years. If you were at the slides, I will see this later. You can see here an outline on how indeed carbidopa Ivolopa is still the best drug to be using. So as I saw it, as I told today uh, to one of my patients that there's a moment when if you have diabetes, you have to use insulin. There is a moment that no matter what your age is, you have to use levodopa because the symptoms are too severe and they're progressing and levodopa is helping that. In the past, there was the idea of trying levodopa later, but you can, you, we cannot say this for later. There's a moment when it's needed and when it's needed, we have to use it. We have to use the right amount. It's, it's to be done right, correctly. There's a beautiful study coming from um, comparing Italy and Ghana or Nigeria. I don't remember it. Ghana or Nigeria. I'm sorry about that. Showing how uh, that in 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 the in the African population there was a delay on starting carbidopa levodopa compared to the Italian population. Well, the time to this kinesia was the same. In other words, no matter what where we started, this kinesia were starting at the same time after the medication was was used. This means that it was. A problem with the, with the disease, not necessarily with the medication. It's super important, we will talk more about it, that our early onset Parkinson patient required to be exercising, engaging, and using supplements. Some supplements, the one that makes sense. Dr. Bauer will talk about this later on. You know this, you have it just because, I just put it just, just because. This is the medication I was talking about, carbidopa, levodopa. There are different medications for dopamine that can be used as well. The idea is to start low and increase. And this is a newer medication, right, Ari? There is a combination immediate release and control release of carbidopa, levodopa. Still very effective. I tell you, sometimes I use it in early onset Parkinson's disease, especially when patients are having problems tolerating cinnamon, when patients are having severe nausea, when patients are having problems with tolerability or with absorption, I use right, Ari. So it's a good medication to be using and seem to be having a, a prolonged effect during the day. Many of you may have used Comptan or have Comptan in their, in, their, in their medication. Well, Comptan doesn't work without levodopa. What it does prolongs the effect of levodopa by about 45 minutes. So if somebody's having a gap, that can be helped, but otherwise it doesn't have any particular response. These two medications are adjunctive, rasalgine and salaginine. You heard that rosagenin was not is a medication that it was considered to be protective, but it's not. It's symptomatic, still works, but as a symptomatic, mildly symptomatic symptom. And you may have read, heard that as well, rescue therapy like liquid semen, the inhaler attempts, apomorphine injection sublingual has been recently approved. Those are done as a rescue therapy when people are fluctuating very much. But if our patients are having dyskinesia and are fluctuating, we can adjust the dose, number one, or if the symptoms are too broad, especially in early onset Parkinson's disease, we can use duopa, so the pump in the jejunum, in the small intestine, or deep brain stimulation. That can be used a lot in early onset Parkinson's disease. We have a data that are unpublished showing about 30% of our patients with early onset Parkinson's disease are about to be getting or have already gotten deep brain stimulation after about six, I'm sorry, after about 10 years of the disease. This is a Duopa. Again, I had to go fast because the time is elapsing. DBS, you know about that. One thing I want to mention that is very important, this is important. So this is something that we see in DBS. It has this very large spread of fluctuation between dyskinesia, weekly movements, and off time. With DBS, you can see us smoothening it up. The same pattern we see in early onset Parkinson's disease. Our goal is to keep things smooth, but sometimes it's not possible. So ultimately, in conclusion, regarding clinic approach, people with early onset Parkinson's disease have a different underlying biology, more mitochondrial, not so much cellular in terms of neurons, but more in the mitochondria. The treatment, unfortunately, is the same than late onset. We need just to be more careful and be very well aware of the side effects of the medication. 
but there is a moment when if somebody needs carbidopa levodopa because symptoms are too severe, we have to go that route and be incredibly careful to avoid fluctuation and using all the possible tools that we have in our arsenal that are not very many anyway, but they're all possible to try to customize, adjust, identify the best treatment for early onset Parkinson's disease. In addition, diagnostically, we cannot exclude other causes that look like early onset Parkinson's disease. They need to be explored formally. Every single time there's a newer diagnosis or whatever new discoveries have been occurred, okay? So I stop here and I leave the door. And I think after me, there's doc, I give the door, the word, the, the, the speech to Erin, and she will go from there. Wonderful. Thank you so much for a very comprehensive overview. We'll bring you back at the end for questions. Um, now I'm excited to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Ross Owen, consultant and associate professor of neuroscience at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Thank you so much, Dr. Owen. Owen, for joining us, go ahead and start sharing your slides. Can everybody see those okay? Yes, looks good. Can everybody hear me okay? Maybe just a titch louder. Okay, maybe I'll move a bit closer to the microphone. Is that Thank better? You. Yes. Well, Hopefully everybody will understand me okay. And um, thanks Rodolfo, this, uh, this is actually a nice setup for what I'm gonna talk about. In the sense that what I'm gonna try to get across is that within early onset Parkinson's disease or within Parkinson's disease in general, there may be different flavors, let's say, and different, and different ways to get to the disease setting. And, and one of those might be, as Rodolfo touched on this, this idea of mitochondrial centric early onset PD. And then others is perhaps a protein that you've heard of at other talks, alpha synuclein, that uh, is really central within the sort of the Parkinson's disease phenotype. So we're going to go through some of these genetic causes and, and how they uh, can influence or, or inform into not only the disease mechanism, perhaps, or what's actually causing it, but also give us a target for therapeutics um, and how we can potentially either slow the progression of this disease down or, or prevent it from, from occurring in the first place. So I'm gonna pick two main examples and sort of go through those. Um, but if anyone has any questions regarding genetics of Parkinson's in general, or um, any sort of genetic concerns or questions, um, feel free to, uh, shout out any questions. So I like to start with this slide in some ways because it sort of is a, is a background to genetics in the sense of it sort of relates to families uh, and how family genetics can inform back into the population. Can you see my cursor, Erin, if I move it around? Yes, I get a thumbs up from Adolfo, so we're all good. So you can imagine, you know, this is a family here um, and then the genetic variation, or if we think of the disease as the effect of being these colored or shaded uh, icons, um, the effect of a genetic variant, because the, the genetics, when we think about genetic mutations and when we think about genetic variants, the gene, they have uh, different strengths. So what normally happens is in the families, we'll see this really strong effect where it will then segregate within the family. In populations, what we tend to see is weaker effects. And what we tend to see is actually that it's not one major genetic mutation that's driving the disease, but it could be hundreds or thousands of genetic variants that are actually driving the disease risk and lack of risk within the population. So I like this sometimes reminds me that, you know, family genetics, population genetics, it's all connected. And that in some ways as a population of people, we're all connected, whether we like our neighbors or don't. Um, we're, we're related in it one way. So that's kind of the way I like to think of the familial genetics versus the population. So what, what does familial genetics look like? Or what do we normally think of as a causative disease gene? So this is an example here where there's say the green is a genetic mutation in affected members of the family. You can see here that the, the father had it. 
the circle is female, the males, the squirrels are male, the father, the daughter, and the son. Uh, and this mutation would be in these three affecteds and not in these unaffecteds. And when you'd look in the normal population, you wouldn't see the variant or the mutation normally. And that's a really strong thing. And you see the segregation in the family. That's what we look for when we look at family genetics. Population genetics is slightly different because they have this weaker effect. So normally what we'll look for, and again, we're looking at the green, um, you know, there's maybe five or six carriers in the disease group, but only one or two in the normal. And really what we're looking at then is a frequency based thing. Is there more, uh, more of these variants or the occurrence of this variant in a population of patients versus controls? And that maybe increases the risk of your disease. It doesn't cause it. It usually doesn't cause segregation in a family, but it increases your risk. Um, and, and there'd be people who carry these variants that never get the disease. So they're not this sort of, I like to think of the familial one sometimes as a sledgehammer. Um, and then these sort of uh, risk variants as like the little archaeologist hammer, the wee little, I'll say that for Erin, the wee little archaeologist hammer that uh, chip away. And it could be thousands of those little hammers. Um, uh, Dr. Savica kind of touched on this, and it's something that I made a note of saying. We always talk about a new disease gene, a new gene that causes a disease. There's just as many genetic variants to protect against. So I used to always present the sledgehammer and the little archaeologist hammer. A year or two ago, I started adding a football helmet and a baseball cap. And basically, if you're these, these protective factors that have this variation also in strength. So if you get hit over the head with a sledgehammer, but you're wearing a football helmet, gators, if you're Florida, um, then it's probably not going to do as much damage. If you're wearing a baseball cap, that sledgehammer ain't going to be good. So there's this interplay between risk and protection. And that's important to remember when you're getting genetically tested, when you're trying to understand the genetic test result, because as Dr. Salviga mentioned, you'll get, oh, you have this mutation and it increases your risk but we don't know a lot of the protective factors. That's hard to, harder to find. So if you get a genetic test that tells you, oh, you have this mutation, the, how that interacts with your disease phenotype or whether that's a risk or not determine, is determined by your whole genome. Um, and that's what we're trying to understand. So a little bit historically speaking, Familial Parkinsonism was pretty much not recognized, and a, and a lot of people still think uh, Parkinson's disease is, is really a sporadic disorder and genetics doesn't play a role. So I think it's important, and one of the things I'd like to get across is, is that for numerous years, people have studied and identified these families where Parkinson's disease uh, really is an inherited disease. And I'm going to talk about some of these uh, through the slides. Um, but I think one of the messages is that Genetics is relevant to every patient. And I think that's something that as you're thinking about as a sporadic patient, let's say that you go, I have no family history of any Parkinson's disease. Genetics is still very important to understand because it will influence your disease progression. Your response to drug therapy will be genetically determined as well. And it's this interplay between genetics and environment. And I like to think of it as a normal distribution um, or a curve where at either end are some of these really penetrant or strong factors. And then in the middle, it's a mixture of genetics and, 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 and environmental factors. So the state of plant Parkinson's right now is this is a list here of the genes that we know cause these familial forms, but they also influence sporadic disease. I'm gonna focus on two, or uh, well, three in a sense, um, alpha-synuclein, and that's an autosomal dominant one. So you just have to get one bad copy. We all have two copies of genes normally. You only have to get one bad copy of synuclein to get the disease. And Parkin and pink one, which are recessive, so you have to get two bad copies. You have to get a bad copy from mommy and a bad copy from daddy. And in green are Parkin, pink one, and BJ1. They tend to cause these early onset forms of Parkinson's disease where the patients who carry these mutations tend to have disease below the age of 50, onset of disease below the age of 50. So nuclein can be seen in both early onset and late onset, uh, and that's why it, I think it's a good example to use. So I'll talk through this. Um, pink one and Parkin, I'll talk about those, and they might be more mitochondrial links. So I made a note here saying that 
some of these cases of this disorder don't have the typical PD synuclein pathology. So alpha-synuclein is really central in Parkinson's disease. It was the first gene ever identified um, over 20 years ago now. And I often think they must have thought that every patient was going to have a genetic mutation in this disease at that point in synuclein. Um, but really, it's a very rare cause of, of Parkinson's disease. It's these mutations in alpha-synuclein. But very soon after the gene was identified, uh, Maria Spallantini and Michelle Goddard in Cambridge showed that the protein that's in the aggregate, the protein that forms that aggregate in the brain of Parkinson's disease patients is actually made up of alpha-synuclein. So the gene has a mutation and the protein that that gene makes is what aggregates in Parkinson's disease. So really alpha-synuclein is important for every Parkinson's disease patient whether you have that genetic mutation or not. And the first mutation caused a typo in the sequence. I don't know if there's familiar with genetics, but basically there's little letters, A, T, C, G, that make up these genes that encode the protein. And if there's one typo, that will change an amino acid in the protein, which then changes the function of the protein potentially. And the first few mutations that were found cause these typos, and we really still are trying to get to grips with what they actually do. But I'm gonna go straight to a finding that came out of Mayo and NIH in, in 2003 that really changed the way we thought about synuclein and disease. And it was a family that was actually followed at Mayo for many years um, and had this very penetrant familial form of Parkinson's disease where they'd get disease around 35 years of age and usually would be deceased within about 10 years and there'd be very early dementia. So it was a very severe form of Parkinson's. And when the synuclein gene was found, they sequenced the synuclein gene to look for the mutations that were driving it, and they didn't find any. So they fired those people and got new people in and sequenced it again, and they didn't find any. So they fired those people and they brought in more people, and they didn't fire anybody, I'm only joking. Um, but what it actually was, was they didn't have any typos. They actually had extra copies. So in a normal individual, like most of us, there's two copies of synuclein. This family down at the bottom here, you can see, have actually got three copies, and this is using a fluorescent probe to the sequence, but they've actually three copies of the gene on one alley. So they actually had twice as much of this protein than they should have. Now, subsequent to that, other families and patients were found that have one extra copy. So there's two copies on this chromosome and one copy here. So they had a 50% increase in the amount of protein. And interestingly, their disease was more late onset, more typical 50, 60, 70. Some of these patients are sporadic. So it looks like there's a dose dependent effect. So we had a Japanese fellow join us who had all these families with these synuclein extra copy. And we started to look because they actually had a lot of unaffected patients. So if you look at his uh, families here, you can see that this is synuclein duplications that don't have any presentation of disease. And these are affected members. And then these are the ones that have two extra copies. So you can see there's a much earlier age at onset if you have three copies, a much later age at onset if you have two copies, and sometimes, or, or one extra copy. And sometimes you don't even get the disease with one extra copy. Um, so that shows that the disease is modifiable. So again, they probably have some protective genetic or environmental uh, factor that's protecting them against it, even against what I would have considered one of these sledgehammer type mutations. Now, is it just these rare families that have these extra copies that synuclein is relevant for? And in fact, it's not. So here's a population-based study. And what they do is they throw millions of these common genetic variation across the genome at patients and controls. And they look for that frequency difference that I spoke about at the start. And when they do this across the whole genome with millions of variants, they got the biggest peak on chromosome four. So each one of these dots is a variant. This is the significance or the strength of effect at the side, and this is a chromosome. And right here in chromosome four, is that alpha-synuclein gene. So that suggests that even in the broad population of sporadic patients, there's common variation that's in maybe 20 or 30% of people that's driving the risk. And maybe it only increases your risk by 10, 20%, 30%. And it probably is increasing the expression of the gene by 10, 20%. 
And that's why you're seeing this risk rather than this really strong effect. Now, what does that inform us? That means too much of the protein's bad. And there's actually two potential ways to lower that. One is by using a technique that involves this, what we call siRNA or antisense oligonucleotides that can actually lower the expression of synuclein. Uh, and there's trials going on using this approach. They've done it in mice models and there doesn't seem to be any ill effect. So they've actually done uh, their trials going on trying to lower the amount of synuclein that's produced. The other approach, and this is a bigger courtesy of uh, Pam McLean here in, in neuroscience and Florida Mayo um, is using immunotherapy. And maybe you've heard of immunotherapy and antibodies. And basically what they try to do is stop, use antibodies against the nucleon to block the release from the cells or, or the spread. Because one of the things that uh, Dr. Savick also mentioned is this spread of pathology and the spread of synuclein. So there's actually two efforts going on based on some of the genetic findings to lower or stop the spread that's targeted on synuclein. So that's a nucleon in a bubble. We've got a genetic cause, it's in families, it's in population sporadic, and there's therapies targeted against it. The second gene found was actually Parkin. And this is, these were connected recently, Parkin and Pink one is the other early onset. And they normally cause disease in patients under 50. If it's a recessive family history, that means both parents have to give you a bad copy of the gene. And they have been connected through the mitochondria. And, and Dr. Savica mentioned this, but basically the mitochondria, you can consider that the battery of the cell. That makes the energy that keeps the cell going. But like any battery, as they get old, think of your flashlight, they start to leak and then you gotta change them. And there's a whole process in the cell that comes along and basically checks the mitochondria and see if it's damaged. And mitochondria, this battery in the cell has been linked to Parkinson's disease through numerous different ways, both recessive with these genes, dominant through environmental agents that attack the mitochondria and cause a form of Parkinsonism, as Dr. Savica mentioned, which is different from Parkinson's disease. But some people believe the mitochondria is really central to the the uh, cause of early onset Parkinson's disease. And Dr. Uh, Wolf Dieter Springer here in Mayo, Florida is one of those individuals. Um, and basically what happens is the Parkin gene, and in early onset patients with mutations, they have lost that protein. They don't have this protein anymore. So the protein's gone. And basically what normally happens if you've got a healthy battery, pink one protein, which again is completely gone in some of these patients, is expressed on the surface and is cut, cleaved off, and the parkin comes along, there's no pink one, everything's rosy. If it's damaged, what happens is the pink one stays on the surface and then the parkin is recruited and comes over to the damaged mitochondria and sticks a tag on it that says, okay, you're for clearance. And it gets cleared and destroyed and degraded from the cell and new mitochondria are, are created. So uh, I have a video, normally videos don't work. I don't see the hand, let's see if this works. So here, what you can actually see is that PARC and that protein is in green. The mitochondria, the damaged mitochondria are red. And when the mitochondria are damaged, you can see the green PARKIN goes to the mitochondria and tags it for clearance. So everything's fine. Suddenly the mitochondria are damaged. That protein goes and says, get out of here, you're done. Um, and that doesn't happen in these early onset forms of Parkinson's disease. That occurrence doesn't happen. The mitochondria continue to leak, that battery leaks and eventually kills the cells. And that's one of the hypotheses that's causing that cell death in the Niagara, that this doesn't happen. This is a nice cartoon of that image, um, that this clearance doesn't happen and they build up and damage it. So one of the things that Dr. Springer is working on is small compounds that activate that pathway when those are missing. So can we turn that pathway on or ramp it up and actually get that pathway clearing damaged mitochondrial sooner and thus keep the cell healthier and alive so it doesn't degenerate. So that's one of the, again, a targeted therapeutic based around some of the genetic findings. The other thing that these sorts of findings do, and I wanted to touch on this, is 
if we understand who carries those mutations, we can use those individuals for targeted clinical trials. So it'll identify the right patients for the clinical trial. If we have a synuclein knockdown, we could perhaps give that, or a therapy that lowers synuclein, give that to those family members that have the extra copies, whether it's this rapid degeneration, and see, can we stop it there? Because we know their disease is caused by having too much. And then if it works there, we can take it back to the sporadic patients or the other patients and see does it work. So based on that, I wanted to, again, I know Aaron highlighted this at the start, but I wanted to mention the foundations PD generation, um, where they're gonna be offering genetic testing and counseling. Counseling is important, don't forget that, to understand the impact of having the variant or not having a variant uh, on what that actually truly means um, to, to patients across the US. Um, and, and there's lots of ways to enroll. The information's here, Erin gave it at the start, but certainly I, I encourage people to get involved because again, if we can identify individuals who have those tar genetic variants and specific targets, then if there's therapies that are developed specifically for that target, we'll have the best group of patients for the clinical trial. So genetics can really inform into that as well. I'll finish with some acknowledgements. Um, I know Erin liked the picture of the two little ones. Um, and then I'll take any questions at the end, but I'll, I'll stop there and hand over. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. I think we'll have some questions definitely for you at the end. So now we'll move to our third speaker. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Brent Bauer, Director of Research for Integrative Medicine Program at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Bauer, and you're all set. Good job sharing your slides. <laughs> Thank you very much, Erin. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound good. Perfect. Well, thanks everybody for allowing me to share some of this time tonight. Uh, some great points already from our other two colleagues. And we're going to try and jump in and, and, and kind of build on what uh, Dr. Savika alluded to. There's a lot of interesting things out there in this realm of integrative medicine, or you may have heard of it called complementary alternative medicine in the past. Uh, there's a lot of things that aren't ready for prime time, like a lot of the supplements, as he alluded to. But there turns out there's a lot of things in kind of the lifestyle integrative medicine realm that I think have importance for all of us, whether we have Parkinson's disease or whether we're caring for somebody or related to somebody or, or just a spouse or significant other. So we'll try and look at things that are practical that all of us can use and may have some impact at least on quality of life, if not potentially even on the disease process. Uh, like Dr. Savika, I have no disclosures, but uh, I certainly could be subject to influence if anybody wants to talk to me later. Uh, what we're trying to look at here is this idea of complementary and alternative medicine. That's the older term. What's this new term, integrative medicine? Why should we care? Does it have any impact or influence for people with early onset Parkinson's disease? And if it does, how do we prepare strategically? How do we uh, walk away from here for something that we can do if we have a disease? Or what if we're caring for somebody? What if it's a, a significant other? How do we take care of ourselves as well? Are there things we can take from the integrative medicine realm? So the first challenge is what is complementary and alternative medicine? When I was a medical student at Mayo Medical School many years ago, uh, complementary and alternative medicine were those things that weren't part of conventional medicine. So meditation, massage, herbs, yoga, acupuncture, those were all kind of over there. There was conventional medicine, there was the other stuff, and the two were pretty separate. Well, and of course, that definition no longer has any relevance since most academic centers are now offering massage, acupuncture, uh, a number of things. So the terminology has changed and we'll talk about how that's happened. Uh, what do we know when we look at the use of complementary and alternative medicine in the United States? Most studies say about 35 to 65 percent of Americans use something in the realm of complementary and alternative medicine. And this is a chart from a few years back. Uh, of course, we are a pill culture. And if we can get a natural pill, we feel even better about that. So herbs and supplements are the number one thing most people turn to. But there's six of these top 10 therapies within this realm that I've starred here. And if you think about them, deep breathing, meditation, yoga, progressive relaxation, guided imagery, they all have a common theme and that is treating stress. 
So we're going to come back to that because there's a number of things we could talk about in the alternative medicine realm. Should we be looking at acupuncture to help with a uh, movement disorder? Should we be looking at uh, melatonin to help with sleep? But stress turns out to be pretty ubiquitous and I'm gonna show you why it's gonna be a good focus for us in the next 15 minutes. Now, I've been alluding to this change from complementary to integrative medicine. And what's really shifted that is the amount of research that's now available. This is a search I did just a couple of weeks ago on the National Library of Medicine uh, this is a site that really catalogs most peer-reviewed, relatively high-quality articles. I just did a search on complementary alternative medicine. You see we get about 19,000 hits. Every one of those is not a perfectly well-done trial. Not everyone is related to our topic, but it does kind of give you the flavor that there's been a lot of research on massage, acupuncture, meditation, growing number of studies on supplements where we can now actually start to figure out which ones do belong as part of an integrated approach to healthcare and uh, which ones really don't have enough evidence. And so that takes us to this concept of integrative medicine. Can we integrate the best of both worlds? If there's evidence for uh, meditation helping reduce blood pressure, can we integrate that right along with the other things we might hear from our physician in terms of medications, dietary changes, and so forth? So here's a definition I like. It's from the Consortium of Academic Health Centers for Integrative Medicine. This is about 200 different medical schools, academic medical centers across the United States, North America. Uh, they did, at least until recently, meet every year and have large uh, conferences on uh, items related to practice, research, education in this realm of integrative medicine. Uh, I like their definition. They say that integrative medicine is the practice of medicine that reaffirms the importance of the relationship between practitioner and patient. And right off the bat, I think we all agree, we want that connection with our healers. But notice it doesn't say doctor, it says practitioner. And that leaves the door open for your nurse, uh, a physical therapist, but also perhaps a massage therapist and acupuncturist focuses on the whole person. And I think that's also something we're challenged uh, increasingly on the conventional side where we're often time limited. How do we take time to see the whole person? So I think re-honoring that, or at least trying to make that strategically uh, back to the forefront is very important. And then how do we use all appropriate therapeutic approaches, healthcare professionals? So for example, if I have somebody with pain, uh, am I limited to just narcotics or can I also explore with them the role of acupuncture, the role of massage, or are there some supplements that might be helpful? So I think that idea of having a broader toolbox where we can kind of tap into best of both worlds as long as it's evidence-based. So that's kind of my definition. Uh, I'm going to share a couple things here. This is not an advertisement. Most of these are out of print or old. But over the years, Mayo has invested, I think, a fair amount of money in the concept of educating people about stress, integrative medicine. Uh, the first app created at Mayo was a meditation app. It's no longer available, so don't look for it. Uh, we've done a number of DVD series over the years. And, and the point, again, is not that you should purchase these, but just the concept does Mayo as a, I would say, a leading uh, academic organization, see the value of trying to bring a whole, a more holistic approach, if you will, to the care of our patients and make those things which are evidence-based available. I think these speak to that. And, and we have a large practice. Uh, in fact, I just saw a patient today for Dr. Savika uh, centered around how do we look at lifestyle as an adjunct to all the things that he's doing uh, and Dr. Ross with all the things that uh, we're looking at from a genetic standpoint, what can we do uh, in partnership to help those patients uh, optimize health and wellness going forward? So again, we could spend a lot of time uh, just talking about supplements, just talking about the role of different therapies like uh, acupuncture for nausea or constipation. But I wanna come back to those six stars, those different therapies that are really kind of geared towards dealing with stress. And the question is, why is that such an issue? Stress is pretty ubiquitous. What do we care? Well, this is a little cartoon showing just a large number of different studies over the years. Chronic stress actually does a lot of bad things. And we're not going to go through each one. But some of the highlights, when we're under stress, our immune system is shut down. Our wounds heal slower. We have more inflammation. We have increased heart disease, increased diabetes. A lot of bad things happen at a physiologic level in response to stress. And I will highlight three up here in the other corner or the upper corner, chronic stress actually has been shown to damage the brain. It has been shown to decrease our attention and memory. And there's actually interesting studies, people under chronic stress, we tend to turn on 
some of the inflammatory genes and turn off some of the anti-inflammatory genes. So as we're thinking about the brain and we wanna do everything we can to protect the brain, and then we also wanna just have optimally good health health in general, while we're dealing with something like, what tools do we have in our toolkit to help deal with stress? Now, uh, does this specifically apply to patients with Parkinson's disease? Well, this is a systematic review from a few years ago. This was a, a group that looked at 11 different studies. They looked at animal models where they gave the animals stress. Uh, and then Parkinson models in those animals, they actually had worsening of their motor symptoms. They actually saw more dopamine producing neurons being destroyed. And then when they looked at the same effects of psychological stress in patients with Parkinson's disease, it also seemed to increase symptom severity and led to poor health outcomes. Uh, another study, just again, not saying, but certainly pointing us in the direction that stress is not good for Parkinson's disease of any type. Uh, this was a, a, an online initiative uh, where over 4,000 patients with Parkinson's participating in this online initiative, uh, filled out scores based on their mobility, their mortality, uh, and also their baseline stress. And, and stress definitely correlated with worsening mobility and worsening mortality. And, and the author of this study, uh, Dr. Amy Miller said, perhaps stress reduction is something we should think about to slow the, the progression of Parkinson's disease. So a lot of intriguing data, but I also wanna come back to our caregivers, our spouses, and significant others who are on the call, because we know from a lot of other studies, any chronic disease, and this has been especially studied in cancer, the person who's kind of surviving with the patient with the disease, the caregiver, the spouse, the significant other, uh, caring for that person, being part of that journey, uh, the increases uh, in stress, anxiety, and depression have been very uh, ubiquitous, quality of life often goes down. And there's been specific studies in caregivers for patients with Parkinson's, where the burden goes up, the more severe or long-term the disease is, uh, stress goes up, mental health, quality of life, that's HQOL, goes down. And I'll show you another slide in a moment that says that we actually can mitigate some of that by increasing our resiliency, and that's going to take us back to our integrative medicine approach. Uh, the last point here, uh, the COVID-19 lockdowns, we've already got some studies coming out suggesting that patients with Parkinson's and their caregivers actually do worse when we lock people up, which probably isn't surprising, but I think we're, at least here in Minnesota, we're gearing up for potentially another round. So uh, we need some good integrative medicine to get through the next lockdown. This is the slide I just wanted to share on mitigating the impact of stress. If you look across the bottom, that's perceived stress. So it's very low on the left. As you go to the right, it's very high. Mental health, quality of life goes up on the up axis. So the higher upper left corner, that's where the quality of life is good. Stress is pretty low. And then you see all three lines get worse as stress goes up. The bottom line, the, the dark circles, those are patients who have very low resiliency. So the, the same amount of stress, if you look at the people with triangles who have much higher resiliency, they have a much less impact, a much lower impact on the mental health quality of life. So there's something here to be said for maybe we can modify resiliency, maybe we can modify our reaction to stress. And now we're gonna take a deeper dive into how that looks as part of an overall uh, approach to health. Now, I'm gonna to apologize to Dr. Ross right up front because I'm not a geneticist, uh, but this is my personal understanding, uh, limited though it may be, of the importance of telomeres. And I'm sure many of you have heard of telomeres. Uh, telomeres are these little caps that show up blue in this particular uh, illustration. These are the caps on the ends of the chromosomes. And there's a, a good theory that these are kind of markers for, uh, or, or they're kind of serving as protectors of the DNA inside the chromosome. And we know that they tend to shrink with age, they tend to shrink with poor nutrition, we know they tend to shrink with stress. So we really want to optimize our DNA for a number of reasons, we want to protect it. But if these telomeres are shrinking, and especially for fighting the disease, knowing that there'd be some way to restore that would be very positive. And it's not to say restoring those will prevent or treat Parkinson's disease or any disease, but my theory is if we can keep every cell in the body a little healthier at a genetic level, we're probably optimizing our natural healing uh, in a lot of regards. Now, can we grow telomeres back at any age? Well, this is a study that says probably. I hope most of you are familiar with Dr. Ornish, 
who's done a lot of work with heart disease. And he's the guy that showed several years ago that we can reverse blocked arteries with just lifestyle. Now it's a very aggressive lifestyle he developed. It's a whole foods plant-based diet, which is very anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's also involves daily exercise. So it goes back to Dr. Savika's point earlier on. It involves one hour a day of a mind body practice. So now we're gonna start touching into some of the integrative medicine and it also requires a good support group. And what he showed in those studies many years ago was that you can actually have blocked uh, coronary arteries that will open up in response to that kind of aggressive lifestyle. Now, what's it have to do with what we're talking about? Well, I think he's a fairly smart uh, researcher. Uh, he looked at a lot of those patients coming out of his study who had improved heart uh, outcomes, but they also came back and said, you know, uh, my thinking's clearer, I sleep better, my mood's better, I eat better, I digest better many, many different organ systems working better. And I think his thought process must have gone along the lines, that's gotta be more than just a heart effect. This comprehensive lifestyle must have an impact maybe even at a genetic level. How could we measure that? And so he did this study. And this was a study with men who were older, 70, 75, 80, who had a smoldering prostate cancer. Now, why is that interesting to some of you who are younger? Well, think about it. If you take older people with a, a significant disease and you do lifestyle, and even in the midst of all of those challenges, you can improve their telomeres, how much more powerful for those who are younger, not fighting a cancer, uh, that, that to me, if we see a positive effect here, should be very encouraging. So this is just a quick slide highlighting what he did or what this uh, interventions were. Uh, very much a low fat, whole foods, very, very important to watch out for the multiple ingredients, the highly processed foods, plant-based to a large extent, Daily exercise, not a run till you collapse and uh, do marathons and injure yourself, but moderate aerobic exercise daily. And then an hour a day, some type of stress management, yoga, breathing, meditation, guided imagery. Then he also had these patients come in for a one hour support group each week. Now, if you look at the blue, that is the gentleman who participated and that's the increase in those telomeres. They were able to grow or increase those telomeres despite all the things we talked about. Whereas those in the orangey side, those are the participants who were the controls. They didn't do the healthy lifestyle. So here we have a very strong argument for whoever we are, young, old, healthy, not healthy, a caregiver, not a caregiver, take your pick. This becomes to me a foundation we all should pursue. What is our nutrition? What's our exercise? What's our mind-body practice? And each of those is worthy of a, a talk unto itself. But I just want to focus quickly on the mind-body stuff because that is kind of an area of uh, high interest for me and in a lot of research we've done at Mayo. Uh, you probably know it, but meditation certainly can reduce stress. That's been seen in numbers of different studies. We can say the same thing about yoga, uh, tai chi, and these are ones you're probably familiar with, uh, not necessarily mind body, but we've done a number of studies with acupuncture. This one here highlights one on patients with fibromyalgia. But if you look at the very bottom, the anxiety or stress had a dramatic response to acupuncture and it persisted for up to seven months. So I have a lot of patients with stress where we actually do try acupuncture. Uh, this is just a quick study from Sweden where they took uh, adults who had stress as their primary concern and they used either acupuncture or a combination of acupuncture and lifestyle. And they were able to show that acupuncture could be very helpful for stress. So something to think about if the other things don't ring your bell. And then of course, massage, not truly a mind body, but something that many people experience profound relaxation. And I think uh, if Aaron uh, corrects me, I think we have a handout for you. We've listed a number of different uh, mind-body practices we use at Mayo Clinic. Uh, we've got some uh, guided imageries there that you can download for free. I use a number of different biofeedback devices that are available commercially. Happy to talk about that during the question. An answer session. What I really work with my patients, then we really try and spend some time. What are you doing for your mind-body? What seems to resonate with you? and then help them find things that work. We also obviously work on that structured social support. Uh, I also include sleep. I think uh, Dr. Savika alluded to the importance of sleep. Uh, and then we also talk about spirituality as something that's important for everybody, uh, regardless of what you're dealing with in terms of illness.
And then here's my take home point. I really try and get my patients to think this way. Uh, they come to me and they say, doc, I, I wanna not have my cancer come back. I wanna fight my Parkinson's, I wanna do. So whatever your goal is, I think of $1. If I was gonna invest that dollar to achieve that goal, 90 cents goes over to these lifestyle elements. We're gonna get a lot of bang for our buck. Uh, you've already heard from Dr. Savika about the importance of exercise. As we look at all the studies, almost nothing in the lifestyle realm is toxic or dangerous. So that means almost everybody on this call can probably go ahead and start ramping up each of those domains a little bit more. On the other side, I leave a dime or a nickel on the table. If we want to play, if we want to say, well, I want to cover the bases. I want some icing on this cake. Then we can talk on a very individualized basis. Are there certain supplements that might be helpful? Are there things like acupuncture that can be helpful? But uh, we, we would do a disservice in a group like this to make suggestions about you should try this or try that because the use of supplements can be very helpful, but it can also be very dangerous. And that's a much deeper conversation, perhaps for a future one, if you'll have us back. So I want to think about those six key domains, nutrition, exercise, mind, body, social support, spirituality, and sleep. As we go a little deeper in thinking of what does integrative medicine have to do with those? Well, clearly we have a lot of interest in the ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting. Those are things we talk about in the integrative medicine practice. Uh, a lot of my patients, uh, especially older patients, uh, can't go out and run, can't go out and even bike. Uh, we might start them with Tai Chi. Very gentle, very basic, but it oftentimes gets them moving. The mind-body things we've talked about. Social support can come through integrative medicine. We do a lot of group acupuncture here to try and keep the cost down, but that builds up a community, uh, some support. Uh, spirituality, of course, that's often a religious experience for many people, but for some people it's not. So we talk about other ways like nature and art and so forth. And then sleep, how do we deepen sleep? Well, first of all, get rid of those electronics before you go to bed. Uh, and then we do practice guided imagery, a lot of different relaxation states, melatonin and so forth. So this is just to kind of whet your appetite to be thinking about each of those domains, maybe some things to explore. Always with all of the things in integrative medicine, always go back to your quarterback, whether that's your neurologist, your primary care physician, your primary care nurse, whoever's kind of helping you shepherd through things before you jump and try something new, always make sure it's okay for you, it's safe for you. And that usually gets us the benefits and not the risks. And I think I'll stop there. So we have a little time for the questions as planned. Wow, thank you so much. I'm very excited that you shared those handouts and we'll be sending that in the thank you follow-up email. And um, with that, we'll bring our other uh, providers ready to take some questions and answers. So one of the first ones we got right off the bat as we started today was what is the youngest person with Parkinson's that you have seen? So Dr. Savika, we'll start with you if you wanna unmute. Yeah, uh, 19. 19. 19, that is the youngest that I personally have seen. I know of some colleagues in other institutions that have seen um, mostly in pediatrics, seeing people in patients that are in the early teenagers, even earlier than 19, but my youngest has been 19. Okay, Dr. Bauer, have you seen many Parkinson's patients in your practice? N nobody that young. Okay, okay. All right, um, I have some questions, Dr. Ross. You're gonna have to help me as I'm not uh, very good on the genetic piece, but the question came in, could EBV start to uh, transcribe to the mitochondrial DNA? Uh, so um, EBV being a Epstein Barr virus, and, um, and could it start to, I don't think so. I, I think there's some talk of, of um, you know, viral, role, viral roles in, in Parkinsonism. And, and obviously with the current pandemic, you know, we think back to the Spanish flu and, and the possible Parkinsonism that occurred. And if you think about the movie Awakenings, um, and, and there's been recent work in AD looking at herpes virus. And some of this work, there's two ways to think of it. One is the viral uh, DNA itself integrating into the genome. And that can happen and then that can disrupt where it integrates into the genome. So it's actually not really the virus. It's actually the disruption to the human genome by it integrating. The other is potentially viral 
viruses themselves having an effect, like say turning on transcription of a particular gene or genome, um, or, or the viral proteins itself having some sort of immune response that then elicits uh, the, the degeneration that can be seen with that. Specifically talking about EBV sort of um, initiating transcription of the mitochondrial DNA genome, I, I don't think that's something we have really looked at. Um, and, and I think this idea of the interplay between sort of uh, viral, bacterial, these different types of sort of infections, um, we mostly think of things now like the microbiome and how the gut microbiome can affect risk in a sense, but they don't tend to be as direct as this virus starts a transcription of this genome or this virus initiates a gene, a transcription that wouldn't be expected. So I don't think it's as direct as that, um, but I don't know if anybody's really looked to see if that, how that sort of infection would, uh, would affect the, uh, the transcription of mitochondrial genomes. Can I say something, Aaron, about this topic? It's to me fascinating in terms of trying to, to list factors and things that can predict. So we published years ago a study that shows that people that were born in the in the in the decade of 1920 so between 1915 to 1920 whereas they were born in that time were slightly more at risk of parkinson disease so likely that was the time where as dr ross mentioned the spanish flu was present but and there's some group in new york uh, that look at um, some viral dna in this neurons so people with alzheimer disease noticing some viral DNA, especially herpes virus. But the problem is that, as Dr. Ross says, these viruses are sometimes in minuscule amounts. We are constantly exposed to that. So even if we found a little increase of the risk, is not the only thing that matters. There's other things that are environmental risk factors that are things that are interplaying so tightly that sometimes virus, I don't say can initiate a cascade, of events, but they can predispose somebody potentially, but it's very uh, yet to be defined and for sure as the virus is not being looked at. All right, thank you. Um, we'll stay with you, Dr. Sadika. Please. Um, had a question about having to start therapy, going back to that slide about no need to start therapy if symptoms are not bothersome, yet you know, they may escalate to bothersome. Could you just give us a little example of like what so, my people I could tolerate a, versus? So the problem is that the examples are difficult. I will give you one, but depends a lot on the individuals. So if somebody's having a little bit of a tremor in one leg, one arm, that doesn't bother him or her in the daily life activities, I would just watch. I wouldn't do more. But if the tremor becomes a problem, interfering with the activity that whatever activity they're doing um, start to have or for example if somebody runs marathons and start to have stiffness during a marathon that is an, an interference in, in activity so when the symptoms whatever symptoms doesn't matter which symptoms at any age but especially in the early onset are starting to become problematic we need to intervene for one reason we don't know what tomorrow holds we don't know what happened in the future. My entire point is that I have to try to help you in the now, now that you're in front of me in the next coming future. I don't know what would happen in 20, 10, 15 years to yourself as a patient. Usually early on the patients, as you know, they're still working, they still have family, they're still raising kids. We want to make sure that you're able to do this now. I don't know what is gonna be happening when people are in their seventies or eighties, or even in the mid sixties, so we want to make sure that our patients are able to keep their job, to keep their spouse, to keep their relationship, to exercise. And sometimes to exercise, you need to be able to be moving more. If you're stiff in one leg that prevents you to move around, you need to treat the leg. We need to make it as such that you're able to resume exercise. So the examples are individual, depends on everyone. I have patients that they have very severe shakiness, but they don't care. I have patients that have minimal shakiness are really difficult, they're, they're, they're driving them, I'm sorry, insane. 
somebody is writing now, uh, yes, correct. The treatment should be indeed based on the quality of life. Um, we cannot prevent the progression, but we know that if you don't treat the symptoms now, then the progression will be a little bit more, it will be more difficult, let me pass the term, to play catch with the disease. Uh, if somebody is having a problem that is motor prevents them to work now or to do something now, in 10 years, it will be even more evident. So it's important to consider this balance between what we can do in the upcoming future, what we can do in the future future, in the long-term future, and what are the symptoms that are bothersome, that are absolutely individual. And I cannot tell to a patient, you should be treated. No, depends on how much the level of annoyance is present and how much they're annoying the patient. I hope it's clear, but it's very individual. So what Dr. Ross says, what Dr. Bauer says, we need to, we, especially in early onset Parkinson disease, we truly have to individualize, customize the treatment for what the patients need. We cannot treat everyone with dopamine agonists or anyone with levodopa. It depends on what the people need. It depends on their level of activity, depends on their level of engagement socially, and depends on the level of uh, um, the, the threshold they have to, 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 to have symptoms, because some people, they do, they do not care, and it's fine. I'm fine with that. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question came in earlier about can someone be diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's in their 70s? So I, I read that. So I yeah. think that is a little bit odd. Um, I, I, I think I would like to clarify. So if somebody was having tremor that started early on, maybe when people were in their 50s and for 20 years was stable, depends on the kind of tremor we are dealing with. There are situations when there's people are having another condition called essential tremor that can occur. So a tremor that has different characteristics is mostly an action tremor so when people are using their hands, for example, and this can go on for 20, 30, 40 years, all our life. And then at one point around 70, 75, 80, or 60, doesn't matter, the tremor change characteristics and it's becoming more Parkinsonian. That is okay, but I would not call this early onset. I would call it Parkinson's disease with long-standing history of essential tremor. There is one variant of Parkinson's disease called benign Tremorous Parkinsonism, when, pe when patients are having mostly rest tremor and not very much else. Uh, but the tremor is very bothersome, doesn't respond to medication. We use liberal simulation there. And these group of patients may have a very long progression, but I would not use the word early onset Parkinson's disease in somebody that has been diagnosed in their 70s, unless the onset of symptoms was 20 years prior, but that would be something that is to be decided what kind of onset of symptoms we are talking about. And in 20 years, I'm expecting some progression. So I, I am not sure that question is very important, but I think requires some extra clarification in order to answer correctly. Yes, and that just makes me think of some of the people I've met who are living 20 plus years, but were diagnosed in their 40s. And Correct. so they, they're still early onset in their frame. They're early yeah. onset, but they're in their 70s. Right. This is absolutely possible. Absolutely right. Absolutely possible. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bauer, you had shared those six starred um, ideas to help get going. It kind of made me a little overwhelmed of like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I need to start implementing. And given we're in a pandemic, yeah. What, you know, what would you say would be a first step? Like, yeah, I, th I think the first step is take, take stock of where you are, right? If nutrition's pretty good, you don't have to become perfect, but we always want to ask the question, can I get my diet to be a little more anti-inflammatory? So maybe all you're going to do this week is add two more servings of vegetables. You know, I think if you keep the targets limited and don't make it overwhelming, uh, if you're walking three days a week, great. Could you do four? 
If you're walking for 20 minutes, can you go to 22? So I think if you, and same thing with um, meditation. If, if you ask the average person to go sit in a corner and empty your brain and don't let a thought come in, very frustrating, very few of us can do it. But there's a number of these apps that can help. There's a number of biofeedback devices. So start out doing five minutes every day a week. Great, after a couple months, go to 10. So I think the idea is not to be overwhelmed. It's not to be a sprint. These are marathon approaches. You're gonna do this for the rest of your life. Uh, these are lifelong traits. It doesn't do it for three months and I get cured. It's how do we optimize health? So approach each one with that question. If your sleep's pretty good, but you're watching TV right before you go to bed or you're taking that last look at the phone, can you just put that out 15 minutes earlier and get 15 minutes off electronics? And then, it, pardon me, after a couple of weeks, go to 20 minutes, then three. So I think if you approach things incrementally, we can be successful and then celebrate the little changes, right? Don't be overwhelmed like, oh, I'm supposed to do 45 minutes of aerobic exercise every day and I only did 20, so I'm a bad person. No, reverse that and celebrate. Hey, I did 20 minutes. That's more than 99% of America and it's better than I was doing two months ago. So if you celebrate the little changes and go for the little changes and don't become overwhelmed, people can be pretty successful. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And uh, last question I have for Dr. Ross. As you talked about uh, the new technologies with genetic testing, if I do have a genetic mutation, do I definitely get the disease or vice versa if I have Parkinson's but don't have negative for mutations? What does that mean? You yeah, know, and it's a great question. And I think that comes back to, you know, the the slide I showed from, uh, from Kenya, the Japanese fellow that joined, if you have a mutation, it doesn't necessarily mean you're definitely going to get the disease. And we don't really understand the protective factors or the protective mechanisms. But one that, again, both Dr. Boyer and Dr. Savica, you know, talked about is exercise. You know, that can reduce the strength of effect of the mutation and can be protective. Um, so no, the answer is if you have a mutation, it doesn't necessarily mean you're definitely going to get the disease. On the flip side of that, and, and each of the mutations have a different strength. So one of the things the PD generation is going to really do really well, actually, is they've got a bunch of experts that know the genetics and understand the strength of the specific mutation. So even a, a mutation, two different mutations in the same gene could have different strengths and effects. So a, if you have a mutation, it doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. And the strength of effect of that mutation could be different than one of the other ones. Uh, second to that, if you don't have a mutation, well, we, don't, we still don't know a lot of the genes that are influencing Parkinson's disease. There's still a lot of families and familial patients, so we don't know what the type or the mutation is. So if you don't have a mutation in one of the genes that you get screened for, that may not mean, that doesn't mean you don't have a genetic mutation and some other gene that we don't even know about yet and are yet to discover. Likewise, even if you don't have a mutation in all the known genes, genetics is still going to influence your disease. It may not be the direct cause, but it may be how rapidly you progress. Genetics will play a role in that. Uh, the phenotypic or how you present with disease, is it more of a tremor dominant or more of a gait instability and more rigidity? that could be influenced by your genetics. Uh, pharmacogenomics is a big deal. How you uh, respond to a specific drug or a specific therapy, your genetics will play a role in that. Uh, there was an interesting study recently, or maybe a year ago, it's hard to know what's recent with everything happening. Um, it was last week or it was three years ago, I don't know. Um, is how the microbiome can also change how you respond to drugs and how the the gut can actually metabolize some of the levodopa potentially so that it doesn't even make it to the brain. So, um, so there's all these different influences. So not so having a genetic mutation doesn't 100% mean you're going to get the disease. Likewise, not having one doesn't mean that genetics isn't playing an important role in your disease. All right, thank you for clarifying. I feel like we could go on with more questions, but we have to come to a close for our program. So thank you so much to our three doctors, Dr. Rodolfo Savica, Dr. Ross Owen, or excuse me, Dr. Owen Ross and Dr. Brent Bauer for sharing your time with us today. Thank you so much. And I just have a few slides to share before as we wrap up our program. Um, 
I just want to say that we're really excited to hopefully bring this program again. So I really encourage you to share your feedback in the survey that we'll be sending in a follow up or after today's program. Um, really want to know what are the topics you're interested in hearing. Um, what other uh, things would you like to know? So please, please feel that back or set, complete that survey for us. And also just want to note if you were unable to get our question answered today, uh, we encourage you to reach out to our helpline or find your provider if you have other questions. All right, and lastly, just a few other things to share. We touched on it earlier, but we want to remind you that you're not alone in this um, social distancing where I wish we could really be in person, but we have these virtual programs available from the Parkinson's Foundation website on Monday, Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, and Fitness Fridays. So be sure to visit parkinson.org slash health, and you can view all the programs that have been archived all the way since April. And with that, please know that we're here. Check us out at parkinson.org for more information or call our helpline to talk to that Parkinson's specialist. And until then, please stay well. Have a good evening.